Hello, uh, good morning, and thanks for being here. So we have a nice panel here to talk about Europe, which uh, we're, I'm sure everybody's always interested in. Um, Europe, Europe uh, matters to us as much as the US matters to us at times, uh, even more sometimes. Um, so um, we have three people on the panel, um, two directly from Europe actually, and Jan pretty much indirectly from Europe. <laughs> um, and, um, and me too, we're all, all in the, in, direct or indirectly from Europe, um, can, uh, and we'll be talking about Europe. Uh, monetary policy, banking, and, um, and the economy, um, and how they are all, of course, <laughs> interrelated as well. Um, so we have um, Paolo Savona, uh, who has worn a lot of hats in the past. Um, uh, was at the Bank of Italy and the deposit insurance scheme uh, of Italy uh, at several of the banks uh, in Italy and, and, and um, the banking association and, and lots of different places. Now he's a uh, professor emeritus uh, at an Italian university. Um, and Peter Pratt, um, who's at the ECB, the European Central Bank, he's the uh, chief economist and um, he's also on the executive board. Um, and um, Jan Kregel, who's uh, at the Levy Institute, uh, he's the director of research and um, he's um, also a professor at uh, Tallinn University. Um, um, and um, we will talk about sort of, um, I guess we'll start with Peter, so we can start with European economy outlook and, uh, and the monetary policy angle. And then we'll move on to Paolo, who's going to talk about sort of banking crises and, and Italian banks and, and all the different banking issues interrelated. And Jan is going to talk about uh, Bundesbank a little bit and, and sort of their push and pull on this uh, triangle of monetary policy, economy, and, and banks. So uh, Peter, if we can start with you. Thanks. <coughs> Well, it's, uh, <clears throat> yeah, thank you for the invitation. It's, uh, it's not the first time, and uh, I really enjoy your conferences. So, not the less, we'll see after. We'll see after, after this session. Um, I have a few slides. Not sure I use them all, but uh, as a backstop, let's let's keep them in mind. Uh, three sort of comments. First, on the financial landscape. Uh, second, about the state of the economy. And third, uh, a little bit about monetary policy. Okay, so three parts. On the financial landscape, um, well, the euro area remains a very highly bank intermediated environment. The first point, we should not forget it. So it's basically credit, credit market, securities. When you look at securities, basically government securities. If you look at other papers around, there is not so much corporate bonds or uh, you take other sort of paper, uh, equity, even equity markets are not so developed in the euro area. So that's the, 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 the first remark. The second, if you look at the, um, the uh, geographical aspect uh, of the landscape, the financial landscape, what you see uh, before the crisis basically, on the asset side, you have, most of the asset side is, uh, are exposures on the national economy. On the liability side, before the crisis, you have a large part, depends of countries, of course, but the large part is, uh, a significant part is uh, funded from other countries of the area. So this is the interbanking market. So you have a, a mismatch in the funding compared to the assets. Assets are basically local, liabilities are more open and intra-European via the interbanking market. That's after the crisis, after the crisis now, uh, what you see is both sides are more in balance, so assets, liabilities, but both are national, 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 assets, liabilities. So is it good or bad for a monetary policy maker having a single monetary policy where the banking landscape is basically national? So you have a collection of national banking systems, uh, which is... Uh, an issue we may think about in terms of risk sharing, for example, across the Union. So there is uh, not much happening from the banking system. But, but it's, it's better in a way than what we had before, because when the crisis came, as you know, there was a sudden stop, and the interbanking market uh, stopped, you know, and uh, money flew back to the uh, 
uh, current account surpluses countries like Germany, Netherlands, a few other countries, and out of countries like Spain and uh, Greece and, uh, and other sort of countries. So you had that. So the system, in a way, is, is more stable. It's national-national. On the other hand, in terms of geographical diversification, that means private sector risk sharing, we, we have today a collection of national banking systems. So uh, if, for example, you have a, a sort of a national or asymmetric shock in the system, the banking system is unavoidably exposed to that. And uh, even if you reduce the um, exposure of bank on the asset side on government securities, because as you know, a lot of the asset side of banks are government securities, their own national state, uh, it will not protect them very much if they don't have uh, uh, government securities because they will be exposed to the national economy. So if the government of a country, the sovereign, has a problem, the banking system will have also a problem, even, even if its portfolio of government bonds has been reduced to, to zero, because they will be extremely exposed to the national economy. So, uh, so we have a problem with, uh, in the landscape, as I see it, as a policy maker, monetary policy maker, we have a problem because we don't have cross-border banking. Uh, so that's the first uh, point on the landscape. The second point on the landscape since the crisis, uh, we have done a, a number of good things, I mean, uh, in terms of banking union. Uh, the first thing is, of course, we have a single supervisory mechanism, so we have supervision is single. Uh, so we have common responsibilities from the system. Uh, me, for example, as a governing council member, uh, the governing council as a whole, but just me as a member, uh, we have we received the decisions from the SSM board, the Single Supervisory Mechanism Board. We get decisions, uh, but they are subject to objection, no objections from the governing council members. Uh, so that's one. So we have a responsibility in terms of supervision. <coughs> that's one thing. The second is that we have uh, what we call a single rule book. There are a lot of national discretion still around, but still, I mean, we have done a lot in terms of harmonization, in terms of regulation, but also the implementation of regulation. But there are still a number of, of, uh, of uh, national rules, of course. And one, of course, in terms of liquidity, uh, the system can provide waivers, because liquidity is national. Uh, thus the subsidiaries will be subject to, and the branches as well, to national uh, constraints. Uh, but there may be waivers. That means that if a subsidiary, for example, or a branch, have an excess liquidity compared to what the regulation you know, uh, foresees, uh, some of the excess liquidity under some conditions can be transferred to other parts of the group. Uh, there are discussions today also, can you do that for uh, entities that have an excess of capital in the union, in some parts of the union, can you transfer this excess capital to another part of the group? Uh, also a waiver. This is subject to dis discussion. I can tell you that these things are extremely controversial and also when you have sort of a political environment which becomes more uncertain, it's also clear that the ideas of ring fencing and reducing these waivers, the, the, the volume of these waivers, uh, re-emerges very quickly, of course, in the discussion. So, uh, so the banking union is a sort of odd situation because the responsibility is single. So the responsibility for cross-border banking group is the, uh, is the governing council, is the governing council, so mutualization, co-responsibility. At the same time, when things go wrong, you first have the discussion about bail-in, bail-out. So there we have a directive that deals with that, you know, the sort of pecking order, uh, very difficult to implement because there are, of course, uh, safeguards uh, in terms of financial stability. We may have that discussion a little bit later today, if you want. Uh, but you have safeguards for financial stability. So you have a bail-in uh, framework now, which is, we have seen, uh, difficult to implement, to be, to be frank. And uh, if things really don't work, uh, you still have the bailout, but the bailout then will be broadly national, national, which creates a sort of asymmetry in the system where supervision is uh, mutualized and the consequences of supervisory failures uh, will still, at the end of the day, uh, be national. And that creates, a, that asymmetry is something that you cannot support for a very long period of time. So there is somewhere a decision to be taken to uh, reduce and suppress that asymmetry. You cannot do that in, in one or two years uh, because you have to deal with legacies, you know, how do you deal with the legacies of the past? You have to create trust in the system, you have to, de the, to develop, you know, what we call the deposit guarantee scheme at the European level, etc., etc. All these things are not done. What worries me, and I say that as a monetary policy maker, 
is that we don't even have a date uh, where we have to finalize the banking union because there's a lot of disagreement uh, about risk reduction as a precondition for risk sharing before you can do that. And so that means that I start my reasoning by saying the landscape a collection of national banking system where the banking systems are exposed to the national economies. The national economies may be subject to idiosyncratic shocks that would hit the banking systems even if they have reduced the exposure to the sovereigns even because they will have basically uh, the national economy as a, as a single exposure. I say supervision is single, but the consequences are national. So this is a system which cannot last forever. What is missing today is to have a date, uh, and I say usually four or five years as a horizon, so that banks can manage, you know, decide on their strategies, uh, if they want to expand or not expand, you know, cross-border. How can you do that if you don't know what regime you will be uh, in the next four, four or five years, which is a, a relevant strategic horizon for a bank? It's not 10 years, uh, it's not necessarily one year, but four or five years. Something. And so I think this is, a, this is something which is, is worrisome. So that's, I finish my first, uh, my first part here. Uh, so I, I'm pushing personally very much for that. I think we've, and the Commission, European Commission and, and and European Council uh, are working on this to try to find what are the conditions to mutualize finally. But I, as you imagine, it's not, it's not simple because what is still lacking today is trust, trust in particular in the implementation of existing rules. For example, the Banking Recovery and Resolution Directive, for example. And, uh, and, and we are in a little bit in that situation, which is not a stable situation. So I think this is a priority. Uh, for, uh, for very soon. Let's see what we get from, uh, from a number of elections uh, this year and, and, and next year as well, by the way. So that's my first one. The second point is um, on, um, on the economy. Uh, on the economy, I, I would basically say the following. Uh, the economic recovery in the euro era is gaining momentum. So uh, we are in a situation where uh, we get soft data, sentiment indicators are pretty good, and uh, even, even surprise on the positive. So we tend to say on that basis, uh, we would say the economy is gaining momentum, and uh, there may even on that base be some upside risk on our projections for Q1 of this year and Q2 for this year. Beyond, we don't know. Uh, we don't see upside risk beyond that. But for the first and second quarter, there may be a little bit upside risk, I mean, which in terms of forecasting, that means results may be a little bit uh, uh, better than uh, all projections. But that we, we have to see because, 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 uh, we have to see if the sentiment indicators fit with the hard data. You know the debate in the US is a big gap between the sentiment indicators and the hard data. One goes, you know, it's not too good, and the uh, sentiment indicator is extremely strong. We don't have in Europe that gap uh, between sentiment and hard data. The gap is much smaller. There is some gap between hard data and sentiment indicators, soft data, but the gap is not as in the US. That's good news. The second thing also that we have seen, we checked that uh, our research people, our economists, is to look if the relationship between sentiment indicators and hard data is stable or not over time. So we. You know, we run different sort of regressions, different periods of time. What we see basically, if you take a PMI sort of indicator, that sort of indicator, the relation seems to be, as before, relatively robust. So we, would, we basically say that the uh, hard data are very likely to confirm the uh, sentiment indicators. But of course, they're very coincident and very short term. It's Q1, Q2. You wouldn't go beyond that. But that's positive. That's why I say there may be some upside risk in the very short term. If you look longer term, I can only repeat a little bit medium to longer term. Uh, we would still say that uh, risks are still tilted to the downside, uh, uh, although we say that the risks are much more balanced. That was the last governing council uh, communication, that uh, risks are more balanced, but are still tilted to the downside. Uh, as I say, for the very short term, Q1, Q2, there may be some upside risk, but looking beyond, uh, there are still downside risks prevailing. Uh, now, the Governing Council meets next week, plus one day, uh, so we are not yet in the quiet period. Jan, very well done. And uh, so um, we uh, will meet and we will uh, reassess, reassess the balance of risk, as you know. So here I, 
I, I will not prejudge what will be the, the decision of next, next week. That's for the for the uh, that's one part of the of the data. The second is uh, sort of disconnect between hard and soft data. So it's lesser than in the U.S., so uh, more confident on this. The second aspect is uh, when you look at confidence indicator, the soft data, and all the indicators of political uncertainty. You know that debate too. Uh, we see high political uncertainty and high confidence. Consumer, business, construction, a little bit across the board now. So why this disconnect? Still a mystery, no? You may conclude that the voters are upset about the political system, but at the same time, they're relatively optimistic on the economy. So there's a, maybe they think, you know, they, they want to express some protest vote, but at the end of the day, they think, yeah, that's no crazy things will be done, and that policy will be reasonable at the end. What reasonable means remains to be seen, but some confident that, you know, there will not be a big shakeup, you know, in, in the economic envir environment linked to politics. I don't know, I don't know. We will see later on uh, how things will unfold. But we have this sort of very strange picture where high confidence, and at the same time, you have high percentages of sort of protest votes, you know, and, uh, and alternative sort of parties that you see at the same time. So it's something that we will know a little bit later what comes out of this, but it's something we observe now that uh, confidence is high, although in political terms, uncertainty is, is high as well. So what is the reason behind? Can, now, when you look at the um, GDP, uh, we have more confidence in our projection. So we think, yes, indeed, it's, uh, we think it's, 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 more, it's resilient. Uh, we had a number of shocks. The last one, the last big one, was uh, a little bit more than a year ago, the emerging market shock, which was a real shock. I mean, I, I really understand why there was a pause of the Federal Reserve in terms of interest rate. I mean, uh, Eric, you may <laughs> discuss, but I thought it makes sense to to say that shock, you know, after the G20 meeting in Shanghai, was to say, well, let's see a little bit how this shock will be absorbed, what will be the policy reaction. And you remember the G20 had a very clear communication to use all the instruments available to try to support the world economy in general. And we did with monetary policy. I interpret the U.S. pause in the tightening cycle. I think broadly, broadly what we have seen is okay. The economy, the world economy is doing better is recovering, the sort of cyclical recovery at the world level. But it's true, looking beyond the short term, uh, there, there are still uh, a number of worries on the world economy, as you know, of course. And uh, so that remains, and th these will be the discussions in the coming days in the IMF. So w when we go back to Europe, uh, what you see is that, uh, indeed, the economy has been firming. We say um, it's broad-based, we also say. When we say broad-based, uh, we see that um, it's across countries, so all countries are growing. Uh, you see also that uh, it's broad based across sectors. Uh, usually you had construction doing a number of countries very badly, but the construction sector is recovering everywhere. Uh, there may be one or two exceptions, but uh, from what I see, it's, uh, it's basically in a recovery phase in most, most of the countries. Um, that's for construction. And, uh, but basically, it's domestic demand driven. It's not export. If you look before, all the recoveries we've had in Europe in the last more than 10 years, before the crisis also, there was a lot which was internationally driven. Now, uh, we have a domestic based recovery, which we explain largely to a very accommodative monetary policy. It's not only oil prices which fell, which is one part of the, uh, the impulse that, that was given to uh, consumption, but also uh, unit profits of firms. Uh, but also because of uh, very easy financial conditions which stimulated the economy and in particular uh, the construction sector now. Uh, but you see, and construction of course led to, to spending uh, in, non, in durables and, and non-durables goods uh, uh, related to construction very often. So uh, consumption is very well supported by disposable income, but what's also very interesting is when you look at disposable income of households, you see that uh, wage, wages have been very moderate and from our perspective in terms of inflation, maybe a little bit too moderate. Uh, and uh, we're always surprised that wages are not slightly strong, especially in a country like Germany, for example. Uh, but on the other, the, that's a little, bit the, the, a little bit the worrisome part of the picture. But the other part of the picture, which is positive, it has been very, very much, uh, it's surprised on the positive side in terms of employment. So employment is much stronger than what we had predicted. Wages weaker and employment is strong. So disposable income has been very well supported, and re in real terms even more because of oil prices, terms of trade gains, which are being reduced because oil prices went, went up again. But basically, you had a, a real disposable income was quite strong. 
because the, the basis of uh, disposable income was more employment than wages, uh, the propensity to consume from income coming from employment is higher than coming from wages. And so the propensity to consume has been strong. And if you look at the savings rate, the savings rate has been rather stable. Uh, now with the increase of oil prices, the recent increase of oil prices, you have seen that consumption has not been reduced. And savings, the savings rate has been reduced a little bit. Now there's a lot of discussion in Europe about the impact of negative rates on savings, saying, ah, negative rates, people will save more because they have to make up the, long, the lost income you know, uh, for their pension. You, know, uh, you don't see that. Savings rate has been stable or even going down slightly. Uh, so uh, we don't see a, a perverse effect on domestic demand via, con via savings related to the negative rates that we have put in place. We don't see that. Uh, so that's, that's positive. Even the latest figures indicate that uh, 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 the savings rate has fallen at the euro level as a whole. In Germany, it's true the savings ratio of households has increased, but very slightly. You, don't, you wouldn't put that in relation to the negative rates. Uh, it's impossible to tell today, and it's very small anyway. So that's for, the, for consumption, it's, it's, it's based. When we talk about it's very rich in terms of employment, it's also due to reforms in the labor market. We also see that very clearly in some countries, including Italy, for example, but uh, even more for a country like Spain, for example. So there's a lot of evidence that these structural reforms on the labor market work uh, in terms of employment, where they have a problem, of course, is in terms of duality on the labor market, because very often these reforms have protected the incumbent and, and, and increased the flexibility for the, uh, the unemployed coming back on the labor market. So that's, that's one of the issues which can explain also the protest votes and why uh, among the, the voters uh, you find in some countries, uh, in France for example, that the younger generation uh, tend to support uh, extremist parties, for example, from the right, from the right, for example. So that's one of the, the, the things that, uh, but that's not a, a central banker uh, sort of pre uh, preoccupation, it's not in our mandate. It's, if you look at uh, investment, investment has been weak, uh, recovering now nicely in construction, uh, but business investment is, is weak, as you see that also in the United States. Uh, but we, see, uh, we start to see positive signs also in relation to the recovery of international trade. Uh, where you see that uh, the export of capital goods from Europe, Germany in particular, uh, has been picking up. Uh, but also on the domestic market, you see the demand for capital goods has been in very recent data improving. So uh, it's still relatively weak uh, in historical standards, but it's recovering as well. Now, if you look at uh, the um, policy stance, uh, fiscal policy has been and, and remains broadly neutral. You remember there were periods in, in 11, 2011 of very strong consolidation, fiscal policy consolidation. We may discuss about this. And uh, monetary policy has been extremely accommodative. And I will, I will comment a little bit on, on that and then I will conclude. Uh, if you look at the, um, the role, and this is a key issue when you look uh, forward uh, in terms of policy making, monetary policy making, uh, the picture I described now, uh, which is uh, uh, um, uh, a recovery which is gaining momentum, which is resilient. We had a number of shocks and still we are on the same path. So they, and we are more confident on that profile. The question, of course, which will occupy us in the coming periods is to what extent is that path explained by very accommodative monetary policy, a very accommodative monetary policy, or by very, very easy financial conditions, which also depends of the international context, for example financial the spillovers, for example, of U.S. policies or, or U.S. financial conditions on our uh, financial conditions. So to what extent is uh, the path I was describing uh, self-sustained or to what extent is it depending of very easy financial conditions for which monetary policy plays a key role? That's the key question for the governing council in the coming periods. And to what extent, you know, the day when the day will come that you have to turn uh, your monetary policy stance to go the other way, uh, which in any way you would have, in any case, you would have to do in a very cautious and orderly way, uh, because we do, uh, we have a very expansion in monetary policy since more than five years now. <coughs> 11 was the last tightening in Europe, 11. And uh, so after more than five years now of uh, very easy uh, monetary conditions, when you, the day you, you decide to turn, 
uh, you have to be careful, of course, because it follows a very long period of that. The time has not come according to the governing council, but that's, that's uh, the discussion to see to what extent the recovery that we have now is self-sustained and when you will start, uh, when time comes, uh, this uh, monetary accommodation, you have to be sure that the economy is self-sustained, has reached a sort of escape velocity uh, that will insulate it from changing uh, monetary policy conditions. And that's the governing council has concluded the last meeting. It's not yet the time to conclude in that direction. So we will see in the coming period. But that's the key debate for the coming, for the coming periods. Now, if I go to inflation, and that's, uh, that's our mandate. As I say, my contract uh, as ECB is very clear. It's price stability in the medium term. And uh, we defined it, as you know, in a certain way. Uh, and uh, it's true that uh, when you look at this, uh, on the positive side, the deflation fears are gone. So I will show you very quickly a few slides to illustrate what I said. Uh, but the deflation fears are gone, so that's, that's positive. You say that's not so obvious in recent times. The second thing uh, on the negative side is that uh, underlying price pressures remain very weak, subdued, we say. Uh, we don't see really convincing signs of uh, uh, upside pressures on uh, inflation, underlying inflation. You don't see that. You don't see that yet. In our projections, in our models, yes, we see that. We project in, indeed that underlying inflation is going up, and going up by 2019, close to 2% in 2019 or somewhere at that horizon. The problem, of course, is that this still requires uh, a very accommodative monetary policy, and to what extent? That's the debate I mentioned before. And second, of course, is that there are some downside risk related to that projection because uh, when you run, uh, one of the factors explaining that path is wages, nominal wages. And nominal wages have surprised, as I said before, uh, on the down. And this may be related to the fact when you run Phillips curve, thousands of Phillips curves, uh, you would uh, see that uh, this Phillips curve, um, there is some, some improvement in the Phillips curve uh, uh, when you have a broader definition of uh, slack on the employment market. So when you take un involuntary uh, part-timers, you know, and, and people having retired from the, uh, dropped out of the labor market, you know, they, as in the U.S., you also have these sort of indicators. And uh, these indicators tend to explain recently better the evolution of wages than the, the official unemployment rate per se. So the amount of slack may be bigger than what the unemployment figure would, would, would show, would indicate. So that, there is some downside on, on that. But on the other hand, as I say, the, the economy is more broad-based and there are some positive factors on the other side. Now, the, the, uh, let's say on, on monetary policy now, and uh, then I, I will conclude looking through very quickly some of the slides that, that summarize uh, my points. Um, the, as I say, in terms of flows, things go better. Uh, now the question, especially in this environment, on this conference, we, have to, we had a balance sheet recession, uh, excess debt in a, in a number of countries. And so what about the stock adjustment? What about legacies and all that? How far are you? Uh, there, I think on the household side, we are very well uh, uh, advanced in the, in the correction, especially in a country like, like Spain, for example, uh, for NFCs as well, non-financial corporations. So I think the stock adjustment is well advanced. We are not so sure. We are looking at that very much. Uh, I th we think broadly it's done, broadly it's done. There may be pockets still of uh, legacies uh, in some countries, indeed, um, th that you can see non in the, the levels of non-performing loans, for example, which indicate that the, uh, the balance sheet, the stock adjustment is not yet uh, fully uh, realized. But broadly for the union, you would say it's broadly done, but there are still important pockets there. Uh, which are not yet done, which are being addressed. Uh, maybe we, we hear from our colleague from Italy. Uh, but um, so that's one thing. So there we have a lot of progress. The question of heterogeneity across countries also has been, I think, improved very much also. We had compared to what it was in 2012, for example, 13. So uh, in terms of banking also, uh, I think the recapitalization of banks also. As I, as I say, there are a number of Weaknesses still in the system, but I think broadly speaking, a lot of adjustment has been done yet. The problems we have in the banking, as you know, in Europe, is basically the problems of profitability, banking models, and the fact that the, the, the sector actually in the crisis has not, has not consolidated very much in the crisis. And uh, so that's one of the aspects of the, the, the low profitability. From our point of view as a policy, monetary policy maker, 
the competition you have in markets where the credit demand is still very weak, which is normal after you know, a debt crisis, uh, but the competition you have in the banking system, which re results from sort of overbanking, overcapacity in, in, in uh, some of the countries, uh, in the short term is not bad for us because banks tend to transmit easy conditions to their customers. And we see that very clearly in the banking lending service. We published one, uh, or we published uh, one very soon. Uh, I think it's in the coming, very soon. Huh? Uh, Michael knows the date. I, I read them already. But uh, you see in general in this service that things go in the right direction because of competition. Now, in the longer term, it's not necessarily good, of course, because uh, the profit margins are weak in the banking system. And then uh, the further recapitalization of the banking system, of course, is more difficult because, 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 huh? because you don't make a sufficient profit. And the debate has been very much on the, the impact of negative rates on the profitability of banks. And some have even suggested, you know, that in our forward guidance, we have to invert the guidance and first increase the rates, you know, before we stop, you know, uh, making purchases of, uh, of uh, securities, including government bonds. Uh, we should not forget, uh, first for the banking sector, uh, that uh, it's not only the unit margin that will count, and it's true that uh, the unit margin are under pressure. Uh, if, you fund, if you fund via deposits and you have stickiness, you know, it's zero because you cannot implement negative rates, which remains to be seen because some, some banks do that <coughs> indeed. Uh, but there is some stickiness, you know, in, in the li on the liability side on deposits. But the impact on the economy of the negative rates all over, uh, for us, remains extremely positive. Uh, our experience with the negative rates as, uh, as uh, getting, reducing the constraint we have on the zero lower bound, and then we have tested below that. We have brought the whole yield curve uh, to very low level. Uh, also, you, know, you remember the 2013 tapering discussions in the US. At that time, we started to lower the rates, and we tested the zero lower bound, and we went to negative in the months after 2013. And that's the time where also we decoupled very much our monetary policy from the U.S. monetary policy. It's very easy uh, to look at the uh, yield curves between the U.S. and Europe. And that's where you had uh, very easy financial conditions in Europe, uh, where we were isolated from the spillovers of the tantrum in the U.S. country to the emerging markets. It's very incredible when you see uh, the curves how our forward guidance together was uh, testing the zero lower bound, so going below the zero lower bound, have uh, allowed us to decouple, to decouple the uh, monetary policy from the spillover. The IMF is coming very much with, uh, with uh, the argument about spillovers, you know, uh, the impact of especially US monetary policy on financial conditions in other countries. Uh, what we see, yes, there are influences from the US, but also we have the tools to isolate our monetary policy from the US. Of course, everything is interdependent, but also there are ways for us to isolate from the US if needed, of course. Depending. And so we had a good experience, so we see the banks, of course, have to be patient. Uh, but basically, they have to deal with uh, their cost structure, which remains very high, so it's easier to criticize the negative rates than to deal with the problem of overcapacity and business models which are not, uh, from an economic point of view, the best ones. And I think these problems have to be dealt, you know, uh, by the banks. I think the banking sector has understood that. It's very recent. And I think uh, in, in a number of countries, uh, the most critical countries in terms of monetary policy, you see that also happening. Now, of course, they would prefer the rates to go up. But I, as I said uh, at the conference in Frankfurt with Mario Draghi the other week, uh, basically, uh, we have to realize that uh, the uh, negative rate, what we call the deposit facility rate, which is the rate where banks have excess reserves huh, related to our QE, uh, the place that with a central bank, they get minus 40 basis points. That's the monetary policy rate. So if you touch that rate, you, you change the stance of monetary policy. The whole yield curve would be influenced by that. And uh, so I will, if, if there are questions, I can go into that. But that's, that, that deserves a long, a long discussion. So our forward, forward guidance has been reaffirmed uh, by the last governing council and reaffirmed uh, when was it last week, you know, in a conference in Frankfurt, uh, ECB and its watchers by Draghi and, and me, by the way. So that was, that's uh, on, on monetary policy. Now to, to conclude, and then look a little bit about the slides I prepared. Why are we in, in all this, <laughs> that, that situation? I mean, it's 10 years, you know, we are in 2017. It started in 2007, at the, the, the middle of 2007, <coughs> that was the trigger of the turning point of the, of the credit cycle. So it's a, Minsky sort of, huh? 
uh, discussion now that we can have. So, so where is, it's very difficult to explain. So what I, I show you very, very rapidly to illustrate a little bit uh, the, 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 how I see it personally, it may be wrong, but that's the way I see it. Here you see the real GDP growth expectations, very simple. Growth expectation, I think it's six years, six years ahead, if I remember. It's not, it's not written it's on the slide. It's uh, six to 10 years, thanks. It's six to 10 years ahead, uh, your growth expansion. Oh, I have it here, sorry, I have it here. So it's six to 10 years ahead, uh, growth expectations. So in 2003, people thought, forecasted thought, growth would be the next six to 10 years, 225%. Now they see it 125%, the next six, there's a lot of difference. <laughs> Because if you, if you plan your investment, you buy a house or whatever, on the basis of your expected income, you go from 225 to 125 at the end of the period. It makes a huge difference in, in terms of uh, debt sustainability, of course. That's one thing you see. The second thing you see is also in the crisis. You see 2007, 2008, these expectations are revised uh, very much downside. So the first part may be related to the productivity slowdown, which was not well assessed by our societies, so the sort of Productivity slowdown, you know that, uh, you know, TFP sort of uh, issue. The second one is more hysteresis, probably, stories. It's the way you manage the bust of the credit cycle. And we had big problems in Europe because at, as well as the national level, as the European level, we didn't have very good institutions to deal with banking crisis. And we had no institution to deal with sovereign debt crisis, by the way. So we had a, a double problem of weak institutions uh, dealing with crisis, very soon. not only at the European level, I mean, all of you know that, and we try to put that in place now. Uh, I said that in my, at the beginning, the introductory part. Uh, but the second thing also is, also at the national level, uh, you didn't have good institutions to deal, to deal with that. And uh, <coughs> so you had a lot of too big to fail and, and uh, a lot of bailouts and all that. And uh, so, so there, the, the way the, the crisis was, was managed, so not very well, because of a lack of good institutions, uh, probably create a number of issues like hysteresis, we call hysteresis effect that further, you know, further pushed down the, the, potential, the potential growth rate. I mean, there's sort of Blanchard and others, uh, Summers and Blanchard sort of argument. So it matters the way you manage, you know, demand shocks, you know, in the economy. Uh, because they create sort of permanent, permanent consequences on growth rates. There, there you see, you know, the, the dotted red would be the, the historical pattern of growth. Uh, the yellow would be the actual GDP. You see the double dip, you see the, the 2009 and the, the 2011, 12, you know, dip, which is related to the banking sovereign, you know, doom loop, you know, remember that? And then you, the blue is the, the, the potential growth. And, and of course, we may, we may, and that's what we see, you close the output gap, you know, in the next, uh, whatever, two years, something like two, three years, you close the output gap in the next two to three years. Uh, but it's not necessarily a satisfactory level of GDP per capita, of course, uh, because your potential has fallen uh, already before the crisis, but has been accelerated during the crisis. So that's one of the... Now, of course, you do the same per country. That's even worse. You see the heterogeneity across countries. I, uh, this is, these are very well-known graphs. You know, this is your area as a whole. Same graph as before. This is Spain recovering very strongly. It's Italy, and uh, and and, and uh, well, Germany. Germany is the blue one. And there you see the on on the on the on the right. You see the bank loans to the private sector. You see a very nice uh, sort of Minsky sort of graph, the financial cycle, where you see the credit credit expansion in in Spain, for example, 25% uh, year on year. Uh, and for the, your, uh, the, um, your area, you see 10% uh, year on year. Uh, obviously, uh, there were a number of uh, warning signals given by the ECB at that time, because I checked you know, in all the communication at that time. But obviously, we didn't have the macro prudential tools or other tools to deal with that. And the banks were uh, not sufficiently well capitalized to do that. So I. That's, that's, uh, I will distribute the graphs. That's a graph, for example, showing the dispersion of, uh, uh, of interest rates across uh, countries on, on, on uh, public debt, you know that. So when we talk about financial repressions because the rates are very low or even negative, uh, we also have to see that in that monetary union, some of the countries had in the crisis period, because for good or bad reasons, whatever the reasons, but the countries had at some points extremely tight uh, financial financial conditions, of course, which we had to deal with. And when you look at the peak there, it's, uh, it's, uh, it, it peaks, you know, in, in July 12, when Mario 
came with the whatever it takes, and, and, and then the, the spreads went down and the financial conditions started to ease, etc., etc. And uh, this is the uh, a graph where you have the, bu the budget balance, that's the flow part, and that's the stock part. So you see, for example, that during the crisis, 2008, 2009, the, there was a, a very big expansion of, uh, of deficit to support the economy. That was a time when Spain, which was AAA, a AAA economy, uh, spent 4% uh, uh, of GDP, uh, I think it was 40 billion for one trillion economy, so it's 4% of GDP in discretionary uh, support for the economy. That was a AAA at that point. Uh, and then you have, uh, in, in relation with the sovereign debt crisis, the, uh, what we call now the austerity part, uh, which is very controversial, so I will not discuss that here. Uh, it's lack of time, also I'm happy to do that. But <laughs> you have this this big contraction in '11, and then uh, is it kaputt sparen? You know, as they say in Germany, you 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 you, you contract the demand, so it's counterproductive. You know, that's that's the the thing which is still debated today. And then you have uh, the the situation today. I mean, which which uh, the, in terms of that's the inflation, price of production against deflation and inflation. The yellow is price of production and against deflation. Uh, you see all these spikes, you know, in the markets, and uh, usually you see uh, it's, it's not too badly correlated with uh, some ECB action when you see these graphs. So uh, sometimes you see this, the fears about inflation of, or deflation are balanced in the economy. So uh, people, uh, markets do not know, so they, it's inflation or deflation. There's a lot of uncertainty about, you know, what will be the policy response and the impact on inflation on prices. Uh, but you see, over time, its, it's, it's deflation fears start to dominate. And uh, you see in recent period, it was really the price of protection of deflation against deflation where it dominated. And nobody wanted to buy, to pay any price to be protected against inflation. That's what it means. The, these are the instruments we took. There are some graphs if you want to look explaining uh, the uh, CDS of sovereigns and CDS of banks. I'm almost finished now. CDS of banks, and you see a very good correlation between the CDS of sovereigns and CDS of banks. You can also link that very well with uh, action of the ECB to bring back these points back to the left, uh, down, uh, for different measures. I take Italy and, uh, and Spain because they are the most uh, spectacular one. That's what I explained about decoupling uh, monetary policy from the US. Uh, uh, that's the balance sheet uh, of uh, US. We decided to uh, our purchase uh, program, uh, we had the discussion in the spring of 14, also here in, 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 in Washington. The reason was that we saw that the economy was losing momentum again in the spring of 14, in 14, and that's why we decided really to have a, a very expansionary monetary policy, because in the previous periods you had, a, the first period was really you provide liquidity to the banks to avoid fire sales of assets, that's the, the classical thing in a, in a crisis, you give the banks time, you know, to manage the problem. The second was very, very difficult, which was the fear of breakup of the euro, which culminated with the whatever it takes, and also the promise of government, the decision of governments, head of states, to create a, a banking union, which, uh, to, and, and also uh, an institution being able to deal with sovereign debt crisis, the ESM. And then the, the, the third big part in monetary policy was really when we started to address the domestic demand problem, which is when we decided to broaden our purchases to government bonds. And you know a little bit about that discussion. And that's about it. That's the inflation, and that's the institutional changes which I mentioned. Supervision, uh, recovery and resolution, that's the BRD, the framework for resolution, and the SRM, the single resolution mechanism, the uh, body dealing with resolution of, of banks, which are new institution. And that's, that's, that's it. So in a nutshell, Things have improved. I think the stock adjustment is well advanced, but not finished. Uh, and uh, in monetary policy terms, uh, it's very important to finalize this uh, banking union and to have cross-border banking institutions, not to have only cross-border institutions, but to have a diverse uh, landscape. We also have uh, cross-border institutions in terms of private sector risk uh, diversification. Uh, and the, the last one on monetary policy, as I said before, that will be the discussion for the coming periods, will be to what extent is this recovery that we observe self-sustained, uh, even if we, with, at, at a point where you withdraw accommodation, uh, is the economy sufficiently robust to continue on, on that path I, I described before. So that's, that's the story. Thank you.
Thank you. I experienced three monetary and banking crises in Italy from 1970 to 2014, when I ended my position as chairman of the um, Deposit Guarantee Scheme in Italy. I am not analyzing the crisis from the point of view of the theory, but comparing my experience with some ideas of Minsky, uh, in particular the um, uh, two months, two, two masters, uh, uh, <coughs> Minsky masters, uh, which considered the um, money uh, as a way to help the financial stability and a way to give credit to investors. During the first crisis, Jan Kregel was a, a, a relevant member of the group of people studying this problem, which raised from the oil crisis of the 70s. And uh, Heimann Minsky uh, was a consultant. We tried to understand what was happening, and Jan advanced a new explanation of the so-called Italian miracle, based on the variable, the, uh, the sorry, the terms of trade as a relevant variable of the Italian miracle. And the oil crisis discharged the terms of trade and was the turn, turning point of the Italian economy, Italian development. What is the history of the Italian banking system? In 1936, banking law was introduced in response of the 29-33 Great Depression for industry and the banks. A large part of industry went under the control of the state, and the banking system was largely nationalized. The law was based on the specialization of banks' activity according to the maturity of liabilities and assets. It was under the control of the Treasury Minister, but the supervision was entrusted to the Bank of Italy. In 1993, the government chaired by the former governor Ciampi and I as Minister of Industry, obtained by the Parliament a new banking law. The specialization approach was abandoned in favor of the universal approach. The hope was to serve the second Minsky master, the availability of credit for capital investment. This was the approach, the idea. The first Minsky master to protect savers, the stability of the payment system, was introduced creating a voluntary bank deposit guarantee scheme. Different from the solution of the FDIC in the United States, which is an insurance company, in Italy is a sort of a mutual system among banks. In 1992, Italy signed the Maastricht Treaty. The Italian Parliament ratified the agreement with a very modest discussion on its consequences. In a pamphlet, I define this choice as a Europe on clay foundations. I fought the decision to enter the Euro system immediately. Instead, I suggested the utilization of the opting out clause of the treaty used by the UK. Now we understood why it was uh, too uh, early to enter in the Euro. Until <coughs> May 1998, when the European community decided to accept Italy in the Euro system, the Italian government pursued the objective to enter the Euro system. Any instrument was monetary and uh, fiscal, was used to abide by the obligation 
to stabilize the exchange rate of the lira and re-enter in a budget deficit of 3%. Both parameters had been agreed in an addendum on the Maastricht Treaty. The most relevant decision taken were to invest a large part of the official reserves in order to peg, mainly in 1992, so after the sign of the Maastricht Treaty, immediately, to peg the lira exchange rate. And uh, my government and the friend Carlo Azzelio Cianti spent 30 billion of lira, of dollars of uh, official reserves, practically all the official reserves. Cut the public investment, they cut the cap to reduce the public expenditure and introduce a euro tax of 3%. So immediately tax. Obviously, the impact of the decision to join the euro is that no masters, no Minsky masters, have been served. We cannot say if our low growth and high unemployment is due to either domestic weakness or to European decisions. So there is a dispute, you know, it is impossible from the point of view of economic theory to analyze exactly, so it's a matter of opinion. But we know that both are in action, so domestic weakness and European decision. Without the possibility to, to escape using traditional instruments of economic policy adjustment. In the past, Italy used money creation, interest rates, fiscal intervention, and devaluation of the lira, and these instruments are now lost without having any equivalent tools in the European Union. So you gave sovereignty, and we had back the, not the same strong instruments. The unbearableness of the situation emerged after the Great Recession of 2008, Recent monetary policy helped us. This is true, what uh, uh, Peter Pratt said. But the European fiscal policy constraints have been reinforced. So we have a better money, but we have a worse uh, uh, fiscal policy. Was reinforced with the 2002 so-called fiscal compact agreement to push public budgets to equilibria. And this principle entered in the Italian Constitution according to the European Agreement. The European Union approach to the clauses is to make reforms, mainly in the labor market, one of the points that the Pratt advanced, I add, and also in the welfare system. But they produce deflation, at least in the short run, making difficult to adjustment of the public budget disequilibria and the economic recovery. So things are, have been complicated. The impact on the Italian banks and the European Banking Union. At the beginning of the crisis, the management of the Italian banks was traditional. It was said that they did not speak English to stress that they were not involved with financial innovations, deluding authorities and the bankers on their <coughs> capacity to absorb the shocks. So after the crisis 2008, the authorities and the <coughs> banks, I was there, were convinced that they were in condition to face the crisis. Also because the government insisted that a rapid recovery of the economy was around the corner. You can see that every six months, the government was saying, next the quarter, we will have the interest. This was a sort of message confirming the idea that the banking crisis, the Italian banking sector, was in condition to react to the crisis. These are the two mistakes. The delay in recovery and in public interventions increased the non-performing loans, as you know. The crisis in Italian banks was made more difficult 
by the promulgation of the European Union Directive, promptly and wrongly ratified by the pa Italian Parliament, prohibiting public intervention to save banks that had already been made promptly by other U U uh, European member countries. It was also decided to create a European Banking Union, transferring the supervision of big banks to a new European Union authority, and the common law on deposit guarantee schemes and the resolution of a banking crisis under the ECB surveillance. I was, as chairman of the Italian Deposit Guarantee Scheme, strongly against, and then ended my experience in the public sector. <laughs> the national sovereign went to Brussels, and the two masters are not served. This is the condition, this is the conclusion of my very rapid analysis. The joint result is that Italy lost the possibility to serve either one of the two masters, money and the financial stability, and the credit availability to real investments. Uh, so the, the amount of credit given to the system was uh, reduced after the crisis, but obviously is a rational reaction of the banks because the, the economy is not growing, and so the banks cannot increase the credit, uh, uh, creating risks. The will of the Italian elites to stay in the European Union is that at any cost we have to stay in Europe. This is the position of the elites, the majority of the elites. Even if we pay with the low growth and high unemployment, any tentative to discuss on this argument at political level or at the <coughs> academic level is uh, practically uh, 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 without any result. If we want assistance, Europe is in condition to give us. We should accept, anyhow, to lose the residual fiscal sovereignty as Greece, accepting the control of the so-called triad. Is the right pronunciation, triad? Okay, thank you. ECB Commission and IMF. Despite this situation, we show ability to survive. Industrial exports are growing, and the foreign current account is in surplus. So there is not a problem of productivity, a problem of terms of trade for Italy. Why to insist on productivity and to ask it to intervene on the labor market? I, 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 I disagree completely. There is no it is impossible to use the same tool of analysis for different countries, the so-called one size <coughs> does not fill to all. The European Union is insisting on labor market and the welfare reforms to increase productivity, as we hear before, but the people refuse to accept them. Such a problem overwhelm economic condition. So we have to decide if we accept democracy or if we decide to give our residual sovereignty to the rest of the world, as Greece. With the difference that Greece voted to stay in the Euro, instead the Italian constitutions refused to accept referendums on foreign agreements. This is a legal problem in Italy. What are my conclusions? The Italian banking crisis is not the direct result of a 2008 world financial crisis. Its transmission to the real economy was due to mistaken choices of a political economy, deflationary taxation, a cut in employment and the salaries, and the wrong forecast on the time for recovery, as I said at the beginning. Non-performing loans increased, and the banks reacted cyclically, rationing credit. The European decision accepted too quickly, I insisted, by the Italian Parliament 
to create a banking union, a new deposit guarantee scheme, a new resolution mechanism, weakened the confidence on the Italian banking system. The waiver of monetary sovereignty prevents Italy from using the traditional instrument of adjustment without having a better policy by the European Union, which is written in the Italian constitution. So we are respecting one aspect, but not the other, because it's written that you can give your sovereignty if you are guarantee that the rest of the world participating, like in Europe, give the same, and if the result is better than to use directly the sovereignty. This is written in the Constitution after the fascist drop in 1946. Italy is now bound in an institutional straight jacket, facing an impossible choice between staying in the European system, hoping for a better future, or accepting to go backward. Banks are approaching the system, reducing credit and gaining from the pay payment system. So at present, the Italian bank system is a rent sector, giving through commission on the payment system without the possibility to guarantee the reimburse of this <coughs> deposit. Because with the new European directive, the Italian guarantee scheme can reach an amount of 80% of the guarantee deposits, which are now near to uh, 800 billion uh, euro. So they have only 1% of uh, the possibility to intervene. And uh, my task when I was instead of discussing with my friends at the Bank of Italy, uh, I was sending a, a graph where there is the level of intervention according to the condition of the bank's budget. For an intervention of 10 billion euro, you, you induce uh, 15 banks to fail. If you intervene with 20 billion, we induce a third bank to fail. So you have a, an instrument which is in condition to create a systemic crisis. The problem is that uh, once again, we have no a reply from this clear objection how the European uh, economic system or the uh, Euro system is working. I still believe that the possibility of, to react of Italy is very high. But Italy, generally speaking, react to big shocks. So continuing this kind of a policy, we can avoid the big shocks, but we cannot avoid the downgrading of the Italian welfare. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to try and present to you a solution, solution partially to the problem that Paolo proposed, a solution for a number of periphery countries. And I will start out by saying that, in fact, none of these arguments are my own. And in fact, the title should not have been the German argument, but it should have been the Bundesbank's argument for a two-speed solution to the Euro political crisis. What I'm going to try to do is present to you the logic behind the way German monetary policymakers, and particularly the German Central Bank, viewed the creation of the euro and the way they would view resolving what is now a, basically a political crisis, I would argue, more than an economic crisis. I think, as Paolo suggested, the problem is this mismatch between the ability to deal with social problems and the ability to introduce the mechanisms that are required for the survival of the euro. And the question is, eventually, you have to make a choice between the two. He suggested that eventually it's going to be the democratic process which decides to do this. 
Uh, the Bundesbankers have a very simple solution, and that simple solution is a two-speed Europe. And I'm going to try to explain to you how they arrive at that, at that particular solution. Okay, if we start out with the Maastricht Treaty, basically, from the point of view of German economists, and in particular those who uh, were in the Bundesbank, and particularly those on the Council, and I think, as I've mentioned previously, in a, uh, in a previous life, I spent a great deal of time in Italy and was attached to the Johns Hopkins Bologna Center. German bankers like Italy a lot, and so it was quite easy to invite the Bundesbank Council members to conferences in Bologna because the food is very good, the weather is very good, the city is very nice. So I got to know these people reasonably well because, as I say, they were very pleased to accept invitations to come and speak, uh, to, come and speak to our students. And the representations that I'm going to use primarily come from Omar Ising. Uh, and they're particularly interesting because he was a governing council member at the Bundesbank at this period and eventually became the uh, chief economist of the ECB uh, and was crucial in outlining monetary policy for the ECB. Simple terms, the response that the German economists made to the Maastricht Treaty was what they called the sin of variable velocity. Very velocity how? Well, without going into a great deal of... Uh, history of the development of the EEC into the European Union via the single internal market or the single European Act, basically the idea was that because the initiative to political integration was stalling, that it was necessary to come up with some mechanism to rekindle interest in the project of a unified Europe. And that project was in the Maastricht Treaty in terms of specifying a single internal market and eventually that the single in internal market required a single currency or a common currency. Now the response of the Germans to this was, well, if we look, the Maastricht Treaty provides for us a timetable, it provides a map, it provides conditions on monetary unification, but it provides no timetable, no conditions or any idea of when political unification would in fact occur. And I now quote from Issings, the vast majority of German economists advocated the so-called economist view that monetary union should be the final step in a long process of European integration, just the opposite of what was proposed in the Maastricht Treaty. But in 1999, 11 heterogeneous countries embarked on a highly ambitious act towards economic and monetary union despite concerns that the euro might fail. As an economist, I shared the German view, which was that basic economic and political integration should precede the introduction of the single currency. It was often at that time called the crown, which would be imposed on the successful pro project of European unification. If we look at monetary sovereignty, the statement, again, this is a statement that comes from, uh, from a German Bundesbanker. This one comes from Hans Tietmeier, the chairman of the council. Historical experience shows that national territories and monetary territories coincide. The relevant legislation as a rule, no, I'm keeping myself going here. Uh, the relevant legislation as a rule defined monetary sovereignty in relation to a national territory. Those of you who are familiar with some currency literature, in particular German currency literature, the expression of the nation is in its currency. The Deutschmark was the expression <coughs> of Germany. In contrast to the normal rule, the Maastricht Treaty implies a clear discrepancy between the intentionally rather modest political integration and monetary integration. After a certain point, economic integration cannot realistically be expected to advance further without the prospect of further progress in the field of politics. Okay, we have now reached a point, says Mr. Tietmeier, at the transfer of an elementary sovereign right, such as monetary policy, to a European central bank is likely to mark that point. 
Dietmar is saying, okay, we've gone far enough with this transfer of monetary sovereignty. Now we have to create that political union in order to allow the correspondence between the single currency and the single political union. Now, let's look very quickly at why there was such stress on this idea of political integration and having a federal, if you like, political structure. And this again comes from uh, literature that was produced by members of the Business Bank. In particular, this is uh, a pamphlet that Otmar produced at this time, explaining why it was necessary to stop the process of monetary integration and to proceed with increased political integration. With a common currency, negative external shocks have to be met with increased downward wage flexibility and labor market conditions since devaluation is no longer a policy option. Political unification must support redesigned, hardened labor market adjustment, not harmonization of social safety nets at highest common denominator. Okay? If you're a straightforward economist and you take away the right to use devaluation as a mechanism of adjustment, what are you left with? You're left with internal adjustment, what we today call austerity. Everybody says austerity is awful. The Bundesbankers are telling you, look, you made a choice. You decided to join the common currency. You gave up devaluation. You accepted that you had to impose austerity. Now, the common currency also reduces government's incentives to prudent fiscal policy. Because number one, there is no exchange rate risk. Okay, what concentrates a government better than an exchange rate crisis? Common currency, you don't have them anymore. Also, what concentrates attention of the government better than having a very large impact on your domestic financial market and on interest rates? The so-called bond mark vigilantes, which we know in the United States. If you have a single common currency and a common interest rate, the bond mark vigilantes disappear. We're all familiar with the famous chart of risk-adjusted interest rates in the European Union after the introduction of the euro, which Italy, a country which had a debt to GDP ratio in excess of 120%, or Greece, which had one which we didn't know about, which was greater than that, had virtually the same risk-adjusted interest rates as you found in Germany. Finally, National differences in unemployment and commitment to fiscal prudence will produce political pressure for compensation from the wealthier or less indebted to the poorer or more indebted areas. Okay? If you have you know, conditions or political weakness that doesn't allow you to introduce these adjustments and you have political <coughs> backlash, if you have pushback, what's going to happen? Well. The Germans said the Italians are going to come to us and ask for help. In fact, it didn't turn out to be the Italians, it turned out to be the Greeks. But basically the concern was that if you did not have a strong political union, the national governments who were unable to impose the required austerity in order to meet the conditions of the euro would then ask the more successful members for transfers. And we all know the German political discussion in which the German taxpayer is no more willing to pay for what they believe to be the profligate behavior of the Greeks and Italians and the other Southern Europeans than the U.S. taxpayer is to do so for U.S. bankers. This undermines political solidarity and support for the common monetary policy. It may even undermine the ability of the ECB to establish the price stability that is the prerequisite for the euro to be established as a credible alternative to national currencies. Now, I've just gone through the, sort of the major arguments. There are a number of other less, less important arguments that are put forward, but you can sort of see the idea behind this, I, the requirement of a strong political system. It has to be there in order to enforce this kind of wage adjustment, social safety net adjustment, and the reduction, and the resistance to the pressures that will come from the weaker countries in order to either ask for transfers or to ask for suspensions of some of the rules. Now, we all know about the various requirements that have been appended now to the 
uh, conditions either for joining the euro or maintaining into the euro. Okay? Why are they there? They're there precisely because, as the Germans recognized, the strong political unification would not be present, therefore these particular requirements were necessary as a substitute for political requirements. We have the, well, the Stability and Growth Pact, the Sixth Pact, the Two Pact, you name it. I mean, every, every two or three years, we come up with another set of conditions which basically impose on the members what the political unification was supposed to, was supposed to provide. Now, let's compare this assessment with the experience of Germany after the introduction of the Euro. We know that there was a very, very strong policy of deficit reduction, in particular in response to the deficits that were generated by German reunification, strong reductions in the social welfare system, introduced not by a right-wing government but by a left-wing government, introduced flexibility in labor markets, and a stated policy of wage increases below productivity gains. So Germany introduced the wage reductions, the wage flexibility, precisely as the Bundesbankers had required. Now the difficulty was what? Well, the difficulty was the failure of the rest of the EU to follow these policies, which has produced pre precisely the kind of political pressure for internal transfers that had already been foreseen in 1996 by the Bundesbankers. The problem was made even more difficult because of the weakness of countries to introduce these sorts of austerity measures now had to compete with the success of Germany in introducing them. So it's not only a question of reducing Greek wages or Italian wages, you have to reduce Greek and Italian wages by more than Germany had already introduced and reduced its wages. So if we look at the post-1999 policy, and this is again, I'm quoting from Issing's, Issing, the 11 countries that joined the euro were all heterogeneous. Now there are 19. Heterogeneity has increased. The obvious challenge was to continue with the convergence process. But there was no speed up of convergence after 1999. Once you crossed the line and you got into the euro, what happened? Well, says Issing, nothing happened. Rather, the opposite happened. From day one, quite a number of countries started working in the wrong direction. Quite a few countries, including Ireland, Italy, and Greece, behaved as though they could still devalue their currencies. Of course there is a problem if wages rise by more than productivity. This is obvious, and this is precisely what was happening, so that the wage divergences were becoming larger rather than becoming smaller. The problem accumulated over time and only stopped because of the crisis. As long as member countries remain sovereign states, they need to abide by the Stability and Growth Pact. Okay? This is the basic argument. If we don't have political unification, we have to impose the pact. Germany and France violated the pact in 2003, delivering a fatal blow to the pact from which it has never recovered. Now, the European Council more or less ignores it. These political failures led to a crisis that was aggravated by the collapse of financial markets on a global scale. So again, it wasn't the international US-European linkage, it was an independent euro crisis, according to the Bundesbankers. Now, since Peter is here, I shouldn't do this and say the ECB is complicit, but according to the Bundesbanker, the ECB was complicit because this transfer process, in fact, occurred because the ECB introduced the policy, if you look at the second blip in his graph, which Issings calls the bailout. Okay. Given that there is no likelihood of political union in the near future, the monetary union with fiscal sovereignty of member states now can only continue if there is no bailout clause. The ECB can no longer intervene in order to support governments and government government debts. Today, the no bailout, bailout clause is violated every day, de facto. I would not expect the ECB to say, from now on, nations must be compliant with the rules. But if the euro is going to survive, the direction should be towards 
agreeing and respecting those rules. Now this one, we can skip this one. The result is what? And again, this is a direct quotation. Within the monetary union, the idea is one speed. My preference would have been that when it was obvious that its debt situation was unsustainable, unsustainable, he's talking now about Greece, no more fi financial support would have been granted to Greece and the country would have had to leave the euro. Okay? We all know that the finance minister, Schäuble, had made this proposal in the discussions with the Greek government. The Greek government unfortunately resisted at that stage. But the preferred solution, and according to the Bundesbanker, the solution required for the survival of the euro would have been the decision to force Greek, Greece to leave. After that, the EU would offer all the support it could to Greece to help its economy recover and ensure that it could rejoin the euro from a much stronger position. Okay? This is an important point because, as Ising notes, and a number of us have pointed out at the time, and I think now is generally recognized, what initially took place was that a bailout occurred that saved the banking system of France and Greece and indirectly France and Germany and indirectly Greece, and mainly stopped French and German banks from incurring losses in Greek bonds. Okay? The bailout funds, which could have been used in order to support the Greek economy and to make it a suitable entrant to the euro, instead went to pay off the Greek and the French banks and avoid losses. So Ising is saying we might have used that bailout money in a much better way if Greece had been forced to leave the euro. And it then could have avoided the kinds of failed readjustment that we currently are witnessing. It created a situation with all the wrong incentives. It would have been better to demonstrate a country could leave the euro and rejoin from a much stronger position later. And as I mentioned in the beginning, this is the proposal, the substitute for the lack of political integration that, or political unification, that is clearly in prospect. If we look at the political conditions across the EC member states, we find that there are, well, shall we call them, separatist movements in virtually all countries, political parties that are rising up and recommending that governments choose to leave. That is, the UK was the first, and there are very strong movements in a number of other countries in which this will be the case. So from the point of view of the Bundesbankers, their suggestion is that two speeds should be possible, but also re-entry should be possible. That is, expulsion is not permanent, and bailout funds, if they're used, should be used to provide economic convergence that will eventually allow the countries to rejoin. Thank you. Thank you, all three. Is the microphone working? Yes. Okay, great. I, my ears are not working, I guess. Um, so we're going to open up the Q&A very soon. Uh, I know you're all impatient to ask wonderful, great questions, but I want to start as the moderator. That's the, you know, <laughs> um, for with like one question for, for each person, um, although I could ask multiple questions, but I would like to start with just one and then ask you guys. Um, and in the order that everybody spoke, just because, you know, that way we don't forget what they were saying. But Peter, uh, I want to start with you. Um, so clearly the European economy has been recovering, no doubt. Um, everything is, 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 you know, on, on the better path and, you know, there might be risks. But some of the things you said, I mean, one of the issues, as you said, this was a balance sheet recession. Um, and when you ease monetary policy, easing rates, even pushing them to negative, but even period, basically pushing them to zero, is supposed to encourage lending. But when you have a balance sheet recession, one, people have to deleverage, so they cannot really borrow more. Two, banks are also trying to clear up high MPLs and stuff that happens during a crisis, so they can, you know, they're, they're struggling to lend more as well. Even with, and, I, and I've looked at data, since interest rates were brought down in Europe, 
lending has has not recovered when they went to negative they basically stopped declining which i guess is helpful but it's can you really use monetary policy to improve the situation so was it really low or negative interest rates or was it whatever it takes that stopped the fear of the euro falling apart as we've been talking all morning or is it a combination or what do we do going forward with the balance sheet recessions and trying to recover from them? I'd like to respond a little bit to, to what has been said before. Uh, also, also, because you go into a very specific question about the transmission of monetary policy. Right. I can tell you, for example, that when you look at uh, things like the banking lending survey, you look at the, uh, we have a special survey called SAFE for SME. Uh, you see, tremendous differences from what it was uh, one or two years ago. So the rationing has been reduced very much. And of course, you have to be careful about the figures because when you look at, there is of course the old loans and the new loans. And you see that very clearly, all, including in Italy, by the way, uh, the demand for credit for households, for housing, is quite strong now in Italy. So you don't see that in the, the figures because you have two processes, the new loans and, and, and the deleveraging, and, and the deleveraging mm -hmm. uh, story at the same time. So I, I would just say that the figures you see from the lending surveys uh, show that there are very big differences compared to the situation before. If you look, we, what we also do um, is uh, to trace, when we have uh, things like uh, funding for lending, uh, we, like the Teltro, you know, these, these facilities we have, uh, we look at uh, the balance sheet of individual banks and we can trace, you know, the money. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we have a number of evidence. But you would not expect to see very strong uh, lending figures. <laughs> but it doesn't, mean, uh, it doesn't mean that with low credit growth figures uh, that there is a problem for the economy. Because indeed the, the firms, uh, basically they, are, they have, uh, most countries, I don't know Italy now, uh, but most countries have uh, excess savings now on the asset side for NFCs. Now I talk about the NFCs. They have uh, excess savings, not only in Germany, but in many other countries you have that. And so it is true that they are more conservative on the balance sheet, but we don't see, as we saw before, rationing mechanism. We also saw that in the lending conditions, interest rates, for example, is the transmission is, is perfect now. Uh, so that's not the, the, the very big issue. I'm not concerned on this. At this we addressed, I mean, now the, the basic questions which has been discussed before is, uh, first, I think you're right. I mean, I was in that debate very much about the, uh, the economic approach versus uh, the monetary, well, they call it the monet economic political approach versus the, so you lock in the exchange rates and then markets will have to be more flexible uh, because you lose that instrument. That was the idea. I, uh, at that time, I was in the private sector. Well, I had mixed feelings about that. Uh, and when you had already countries which were very close in terms of integration of product and labor market, if you take the Benelux countries with Germany, France would be a border case, and then you get, uh, well, Italy, where a little bit the north of Italy and the south of Italy, because the north had no problem at that time, and still now uh, with the exchange rate, for example. So the situation is, I think, much more complicated than what has been described. Uh, but it is true, the basic uh, come from that, so it was a sort of open club. And so the tr politicians tried to design a sort of uh, entry conditions, which, by the way, were not respected, by the way, because the idea was... Uh, that since we have a single monetary policy, you need to have other adjustments, so structural reforms, together with fiscal capacity at the same time. So, and, and that indeed didn't work, uh, as was planned at that time. So I, I, take, I take this. I think uh, in the crisis you have to, well, before I go to that, I think we have to be very careful about the nostalgic, about the exchange rate as an adjustment mechanism. I think we have to be very careful about that. If you remember also, the exchange rate tends to overshoot usually. Uh, you paid very high price in the risk premium. I don't know what were the interest rates in Italy in 93, for example, before uh, they enter in this convergence process, but they were higher than 20% at some point in Italy. I know, I, I mean, it's, it's not the 20%. history of Italy, also the rest of the world. 
No, the east no, of that's it. not true. In also, Germany, also they were in not Europe. at 20%. In Germany, in Belgium, they yeah. were not at 20%. So what I say that if you lose your credibility my God. In, in, in monetary policy, no, if you lose, it's not my goal. If you lose your credibility, you pay a very high price. So I think I, I can take some of the points you make, but I cannot take the point to say that you have a free ride because you have the exchange rate. It's a perfect instrument of adjustment. I can also see the literature because the independence you have on, on, on the exchange rate instruments and the economic performance of the country. Good luck if you want to find, you, you can find uh, cases in all directions, you know. Peter, uh, so Peter, may, may, may No, you don't it. interrupt me now. <laughs> <laughs> you, you, you take it after. Because I think you make a caricature also, as many oh, populists sorry. are doing, you're making a caricature of the situation. I'm not making a caricature, just warn that this nostalgia about the exchange rate, I think you should not fool, fool the people. Because the exchange rate is a difficult, uh, 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 adjustment mechanism, not so, such an easy mechanism. And you pay very quickly the price in that. There are a lot of overshooting stories. I can tell a number of, that's why many countries wanted to enter the monetary union. And they wanted to have hybrid system where you have the, you know, you remember the snake, you know, they have the sort of fixed but adjustable mechanism. We should not forget all this period also there. So that's one point. Also, when we had the exchange rate crisis in 92 and 93, the single market was very much in danger also at that time. You remember when there were parallel imports, there were problems of uh, automobile imports in some place of Europe because Italy had devalued very much the currency. And so the market became, the internal market was very much at risk. Also the question of exit, uh, I, I can take all the points. I, 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 I'm not sure that you're totally right when you say this is the Bundesbank position. I will ask Jens next week. But I don't think... Uh, Ex-Bundesbank. Ex well, uh, Ex-Bundesbank, uh, maybe. But that's already a qualification compared to what Jan was saying before. So one has to be very careful and very precise in these things. Well, it can be Otmar, uh, that maybe is not, is not Bundesbank anymore. As you say, it's Ex-Bundesbank. Uh, so that makes a big difference. Uh, so we'll see what's the position there. Now, so be careful about the, the, the exchange rate as an adjustment mechanism. I just, just say that. I don't, I don't say more than that. And we can discuss. And also be careful about saying that there is a, an easy road for exit. There are a number of externalities to that. Now, when I say this is a situation which I don't say that there were not mistakes. Huh? So, the, the, so there I can also list a number of mistakes before the construction. I, I take some of the points you make. I, I think and the, the points I was taking as relatively easy mistakes at that time we, we should have incorporated is having a single market with a single currency without strong mechanisms dealing with credit cycles, financial cycles. And if I compare Italy with Spain, for example, uh, Spain for me is a relatively easy case compared to Italy. Uh, because there we have a, a classical uh, uh, real estate crisis with external uh, funding, cheap funding. It's relatively easy to explain. Uh, the, the, the length of the credit cycle in real estate created also uh, distortions uh, because a lot of the um, savings capacity went into non-productive sector, of course, so that reduced the potential growth rate of, of Spain. These questions are being addressed by the country. I think they came late in the response to the banking crisis, uh, but they have addressed it very forcefully at some, some point. I mean, I, I, I remember the discussions I had with the Lindos at that time, uh, and, and, and the adjustment happened. And you see how, how the economy is improving very much also uh, in, in uh, that's a relatively classical crisis. There are the mistakes we made about, you know, not having the macro prudential tools, uh, not having, you know, proper crisis resolution mechanisms. I think these things are being addressed. Much more difficult, and there, there um, I, I, I tend to agree with some of the points you made, are more the structural things. I don't think that's so much related to, to the extreme. <coughs> I cannot understand why uh, one doesn't go to the real problems of the Italian economy, which is why uh, productivity stopped to grow all in the early 90s. It's not related, I, I, I fully disagree with, with your suggestion that it's related to the exchange rate regime. I think really the Italian situation is, uh, is to do with a lot of structural, structural issues that you have. Look at uh, the uh, solvency law, look about the judicial system, look at the, the, uh, the rule of law in, uh, in, in contract. If you want to uh, realize your collateral, how much years it has taken, it has nothing to do with the, the, the exchange rate mechanism, the exchange rate regime in which you are. Uh, so the mistake, and there I, I join Jan to some extent, is to say that there was the illusion that by locking the exchange rate in a, irrevocably, 
uh, governments would, would then uh, indeed do these necessary reforms. And this, this was uh, obviously too optimistic, and it didn't happen. But the problems with or with the exchange rate, with the exchange rate freedom, are not these problems we see on the labor market in Italy, the rule of law, the solvency regime, and all these things, the product market competition, these things will still exist. And, that. and if you believe that uh, the exchange rate will give you a free right to avoid these reforms, that's uh, an illusion. That's fooling people. Okay, let, okay, Paul, we're, we're, I'm gonna let you respond to, yeah, to sure. that, but I, I do wanna add a question uh, to relate it to what you were saying earlier, so double barrel. You can respond to Peter and also then go on to my question, which was, okay. from what I understand, you were basically saying, uh, we made the mistake in Italy by not bailing out our banks uh, before the whole bail-in regime came in. Everybody else did it, Spain did it, Ireland did it, Greece did it, we should have done it. So you're basically saying we should have, but then, Italy, with the you know debt level, public debt level reaching 120 percent of GDP, would have gone up with the, with that bailout. Wouldn't that be problematic going forward? Sustainability. I mean, look, Greece is you know three three bailouts later, um, its its debt level is is it's at a horrible level. So, to keep that in mind. But you can start with responding to Peter. If you want. I start from the second question, <laughs> <laughs> which is easier. I mean. So it was a mistake. Now we recognize that it was a mistake because the banking system and the Italian government and the Bank of Italy was against it to intervene in favor of the banks for two main reasons. First of all, we had some uh, budget uh, problems and so no money to invest and the people were asking to have directly assistant, not to, to assist banks. The second are the banks. The problem of private banks in Italy is that they have no sufficient capital. And if you rise, uh, or, or if you ask to increase the capital, you are changing the equilibrium of the shareholders inside, between the foundation of banks and so on. So the system was paralyzed by the various instances. So it was a mistake, now we, it is clear that it was a mistake, it no problem. The first problem, we, I am not accusing the central bank for the exchange rates and I add for the credit rationing, because it's not a task of the bank to do that, because the exchange rate was left to the government and there was a mistake because the central bank should be responsible of exchange rates because with the monetary policy is in condition to influence exchange rates. And exchange rates in a model like an export-led model are very important. The history of Italy is clear from, the, from this point of view. You don't know the economic history of Italy. The adjustment in 1992 and then in 1995, of the exchange rate, it immediately reversed the condition of the balance of payments. And now we have no problem of exchange rate, I insisted on this point. We have a surplus. So we have a problem of exchange rate because for a lot of reasons, included the current political conditions, people don't believe more in Europe and in Italy and so they are exporting uh, money, and so the exchange rates is under pressure. But we don't need it now. We, we do not consider now that the problem in Italy is a problem of productivity, is a problem of terms of trade. At the beginning, I, I said that Jan Kregel uh, uh, advanced the model based on the terms of trade, not on monetary parities, on the terms of trade. And the terms of trade of Italy are favorable, which is different from Greece. This is why I say if we have to implement the suggestion of Jan Kregel that two days ago Professor Sin insisted again to permit people to leave, to adjust, to go back. So your point is about, yeah, is the problem that you put is the relevance of exchange rates, or from the point of view of the economic history of Italy, is one of the variables. I said that 
What happened is that we need to control money, to control the interest rate, the exchange rates, and the possibility of intervening in fiscal policy. Naturally, it's uh, based on a general principle, because if you have a political condition inside, not uh, able to government these four variables, it's better to stay in Europe. I am insisting that we need Europe, we need in a common market in Europe, because if you don't have the same uh, money when you have a common market, the system enters in crisis because there is no adjustment of the exchange rates. It is the philosophy. And this is why many people, including myself, and the young Regel said that to have the euro was the end of the story of the political unification. This was the mistake. And the ECB has no responsibility on that. The only responsibility is that you are not stressing that this is the problem. I can understand that you cannot do that. But the problem is that you cannot have a money without a political unification of Europe. So if you give a reply that is possible to do that, saying that the euro is irreversible only because you are forced to, to keep the euro, uh, 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 any cost you pay for that, this is a wrong approach from the political point of view, because we'll never reach a consistency between the economic development and social development. Then you have the uh, three star, five stars movement in Italy, which is going to power, because this is the problem, because now they vote against, and not in favor. We are not in favor of five star movements. We are against the other <laughs> initiative. And the same is in France. If, Marie Le Pen <laughs> will win. They are voting not in favor of Marie Le Pen, but against the, 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 the political implemented by Hollande and the others that are following the same, the same in line. We have to understand that. So there is a problem. And Roosevelt said once that when something do not work, you have to change. So if you are happy that the system is working, no, <laughs> I thank you. I don't know. This is my position. So, yes. and now there is a, an important point of view that exchange rate in Italy is very, very efficient. Is the base of the uh, uh, the um, economic policy in Italy since after the World War, and also during the fascist period, because during the 1926. The, uh, the Mussolini uh, uh, revalued the, the lira, uh, revalued the lira, it created a lot of problems in the economy. Because for the first 10 years, the fascists were successful and also pegged by the United States, also some other countries. But after the decision of 1926 to uh, uh, revalue the lira, the, 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 the economy, the Italian economy, uh, went really in, in a disastrous uh, condition. And we enter in the war in, a, in economic, severe economic crisis. It was a, a good shock, a big shock uh, for Italy, <laughs> because otherwise if uh, Mussolini behaved like <coughs> Francisco Franco, perhaps Italy uh, now uh, will be under the old organization of fascists. But now Europe is pushing to go back with the five star to the same condition, because it's a confusion in fascism, the five stars. And so I, I hope that Europe take care of this political evolution in Italy, induced by economic management of Europe. Thanks. Um, Jan, if I may ask uh, one of you, and then we'll open up to questions. Um, so the way I understood, so you said the bond vigilantes don't work because uh, you have a single currency, so everybody, you know, all the, all the interest rates went down to the same level, the pre-crisis, and they did. I, I, I remember doing a chart, uh, Greek bonds were at 20%, uh, Italian bonds were at 10%. They all came down to the same level with the German bonds. Um, but that was partly because of the no 
um, everybody expected no bailout to really mean bailout and the euro to stay together. During the crisis, during the sovereign uh, debt crisis in Europe, we saw that those spreads widened. I mean, German bonds stayed low, but the Italian bonds, Greek bonds, Spanish bonds, they all went way up. Uh, so, so investors were pricing in the risk of them uh, defaulting, and Greece did default very late, and after all the debt had been transferred to the public sector. But instead of, of trying to you know, get countries out of the euro uh, so they can readjust and come back and whatever, is it possible that we actually really stick to the no bailout clause and investors now do expect sort of the way too big to fail in banking no longer exists and you expect the bank to fail so you can lose money as a creditor, then, then countries will have to adjust their structural uh, problems because otherwise the bond investors will punish them separately from whatever other euro countries' bonds are doing. Do you see that as a, as a potential uh, solution? OK, again, I will, I will do tr no, truth in lending now. As I have started out in the beginning, I said this, most of this was taken from uh, pamphlets that had been written either before or after the uh, introduction of the euro. So this is, as I said, this is not my own evaluation or position. On the other hand, I thought it was very useful. Very useful why? Because we're currently in a situation in which the policies that are being implemented in order to keep countries within the euro are producing political responses which may, in fact, eventually cause countries to leave. So, number one, I thought it was very interesting that if you go back to the beginning, that this is something that was foreseen already before the introduction of the euro. That is, the Bundesbank had this as a, a possible solution. And it also provides a response to these political pressures. And what are the political pressures? Well, it is eventually taking on this idea of two-speed solution, one which so far has only been, as far as I know, advanced by members of the German government or the Bundesbank, but eventually, I presume, will come under increasing discussion. So the question was, was is there some logic behind this? Why are all these people pushing for two-speed? Is it because we want the Greeks to forever be excluded from Europe? Or does this still enter into the idea of a project of eventual European unification and integration? And it's from that particular point of view, I thought this uh, presenting the discussion in this way was, was particularly, particularly important. Now, in order to respond to the question, as we said, the proposition that I made was that in the period before the introduction of the euro, in fact, okay, the convergence of risk-adjusted yields had been foreseen. Okay, they expected this to happen. Now, this is, number one, for anybody looking from the outside, totally illogical. If you look at the debt-to-GDP ratios, the divergence of debt-to-GDP ratios across countries, you would never have expected that you would have had that kind of convergence. Secondly, if you had taken into account the fact that monetary unification was only monetary unification and not unification of national capital markets or national supervisory structures, you also would have been extremely surprised that you had this sort of, this sort of convergence. So not so much my argument that the bond vigilantes could not, it's that the bond vigilantes were so fooled in the beginning, as you say, by the fact that the no bailout or the bailout clause was going to rule. I'm not sure which one, uh, which one is more relevant, okay? Because if you're a banker in these sorts of conditions, you know, the no bailout clause says, yes, I've done the right thing because the countries will, in fact, introduce policies that will make, their, make convergence a reality. Or if the bailout clause, no bailout clause is not substituted, then I have no problem because I'm going to get paid off anyway. <coughs> Okay, so in that sense, it really didn't make much difference whether you had the bailout clause or you had the no bailout clause. The point is that 
if you look at the logic behind the argument, and this is, I just now realized that I'd skipped over this slide uh, when I did the presentation, which is, again, a crucial part of the, of the argument, is this, the, the statement, again, this comes straight from, from Ising. While the conditions for entry are strict and failure to meet them produces the ultimate sanction, exclusion from the euro. Okay, so he said, after entry, there are few sanctions for failure to maintain entry conditions. Here is an asymmetry that is inappropriate in the design of the system. And he's saying, how do you resolve that? Well, you need incontrovertible pre-entry proof. How you get this, I'm not sure, because Goldman Sachs exists in the world, and Goldman Sachs is always going to be able to produce for you a debt-to-GDP ratio <laughs> and a deficit which meets the entry conditions. But if you believe that you can find incontrovertible pre-entry proof and hard post-entry sanctions that debt and deficit conditions will be met. And then, bottom line, this requires strong political unification. You need a, a government that is willing to do this. Now, the other part of the argument is that it's not that devaluation may be more successful. It's the fact that devaluation is the politically easy solution. That is, the devaluation may not work. That is, you may end up losing more in terms of potential GDP than if you had acted initially in order to bring about the adjustment. But that's really not the, the discussion that's going on here. The fact is that devaluation is the way the government avoids having to take these very hard domestic solutions. So basically, what are you doing? Well, if you have an internal dispute between manufacturing and labor, and labor wants a real wage which is of this level, and the manufacturing industry believes real wages have to be this level, and the government cannot resolve it, what do you do? you give it to the exchange markets. And the exchange markets then eventually impose that solution. So the argument I think they're making is that unless you have the government that is able to do that, to resist the devaluation when you have that possibility, then it really does not, nothing, you know, it, do, it does not provide any, necessarily any better solution. But the point is, once you're in the system, that is no longer available, so it means your only alternative is basically introducing the kind of austerity which is going to pollute, is going to... Do. Austerity, what? Well, <laughs> well, okay, but adjustable. No, this, no, this is what I don't understand yeah, okay. this discussion. I think there are many reforms which are really uh, independent of your, your extreme rate. Yeah, okay, that, point... And, yeah, and the list, unfortunately, is huge in Europe. Is yeah, huge, okay. Yes. Point uh, yeah, and, point uh, taken. I, I think this is the basic yeah. problem. So with always the exchange rate flexibility, it is true that you can have breathing uh, space. You know, with uh, historically you have seen that. Yeah. But the problems come back immediately, very quickly. You, because of import prices going up, there are very small open economies. Uh, you know, in this uh, very integrated in, in in the global production chain yeah. and. Uh, and so very quickly you, you lose yeah. the benefit. You know, when, when in Belgium we devalued many years ago and uh, uh, we immediately had wage control to, to avoid this. So yeah. governments were extremely unpopular, yeah. so you could use these windows sometimes. Uh, but you do it once, twice, and then markets start to learn very quickly. Yeah. And then as soon as there is a, the constraints via capital markets, you know, in an exchange, a free floating exchange regime comes very quickly. And if markets do not trust it, you pay you pay a very high uh, risk premium uh, in the markets. Where you have a point, I, I agree with you. Once you're in, you know what are the the disciplining. So it, it's it's sort of mutual trust, you know, sort of system that you put to put in place, where the sanctions are really quasi non-existent, and and that's a real problem here. Yeah. And that creates the trust that we have today, in the completion of the banking union, for example. Uh, no, on the, on the Italian banking system, just to, to, to clarify... Okay, I want to open point, up the questions so we uh, have that. Well, now okay. that I said it, uh, <laughs> it is true that I, I remember very well the, the first wave, uh, it is true. I remember also the discussion. Italy was totally isolated uh, from, from the uh, global financial system, and, uh, and it was even given as, as an example of a, maybe not a very efficient system, but something that would be outside of you know, financial innovation and all that. And it's, it's really the, the, the two, uh, three recessions actually in Italy that really uh, uh, created the problem in Italy. So it was a more a macro story in Italy there, I agree on that, uh, than the, the, the Spanish case, which is a different sort of case. And uh, so, um, but no, I stopped because... Okay, okay, yes, I, I really do want to open up the questions we have, yes. 
Uh, where do we start? I think oh, I saw that hand right next to you, that gentleman. Yes, I saw his hand first. Sorry. Thank you very much. This has been a terrific panel. Um, I wanted to make some comments about we, we had a political problem back in the 90s, as you were saying, Jan. We didn't come up with a political solution. I think we're going to come up with a bunch of political solutions if we don't deal with something soon because of all that was commented about the separatist movements in so many countries. Um, I think deflation um, is, is much harder socially than reflation. And I'm not talking about hyperinflation. And I think <clears throat> one of the keys to the problem that has developed that wasn't discussed was the, the assumption that wage increases should be below productivity. If, if we do this for many years, for many years, for many years, you have a period where one country, a major country, is massively more productive at lower cost than the other countries. And they've been doing this for years. And, and so I guess what I would like you to, to say, you know, P Peter, particularly when you're meeting with the new <coughs> Bundesbank, can't they begin to raise wages at least in line with productivity? or perhaps even more than productivity since they've been doing it for so many years. You know, I and other people thought Trump was crazy again when he talked about Germany has to revalue their currency. Well, he's wrong. They can't revalue their currency, but they can adjust their wages. And it would be a better solution than many countries leaving the EU. Okay. During period of deflation, it's easier to reduce salaries instead of increasing productivity. This is the kind of adjustment which is, uh, at least in Italy and uh, somewhere, they say. So the problem is, again, deflation. And the people are not sensible to deflation, are sensible to unemployment as a result of the deflation. And they instead accept the more inflationary period. This is my point of view. Okay, we'll take a few more questions. I, I saw his hand also very fast. Uh, Jan's wondering what I'm going to say. Because Dimitri's not here. We've talked about Dimitri, Papa Dimitrius. It's very involved with Greece and everything else. You said something, Jan, that sort of been flashed over and nobody's really discussed it. You talked about the political aspects, not monetary. If you remember here about a week ago, Hannah Arendt from uh, Heidelberg University had a speaker discussing the euro. And the, basically the speaker basically said one thing that was very interesting that without a constitution, you've got a real problem. No matter how many geniuses there are in economics, it's a real problem without a constitution to meld all the countries. But what you said about Italy, World War II, and I'm gonna go back before the Maastricht, and where I get my information is from friends of Dimitri, and more important, names that you all recognize, Moens Camry, the former vice chairman of the EU, who just passed away just before Christmas. Why was the EU really put together? Nobody wants to discuss it here, it hasn't been brought up. But among economists of your day, go back to Italy, during World War II and prior to 1990s, I'm going out of the middle 80s, the original concept, and you mentioned it, Jan, about political, was really, yes, economics was very important, but it was also among this group and Moens was a very big backer of it, and so was other people, to stop World War III. That was the basic understanding of what everybody had and what they were trying to do, all right? And you mentioned it about World War II, the Italian situation, and as you know, many countries that went into Maastricht, like Holland, or the Dutch, all of a sudden found that their money had been greatly depreciated by what was set up at that particular time. So I just want to bring that up to you because you mentioned it, Jan, about the political ramifications, which hasn't really been discussed, and you mentioned it with reference to Mussolini during that particular time. 
And that was really the undercurrent of a lot of things that went on in the economic situation. And that's according to people that Dimitri knows, and that's according to, including Moen's Camry, that you both know of or know who he is, who just passed away with the Vice Chairman of the EU. Thank you. Other questions? Yeah. Uh, right there. And Okay. Torl Mo uh, Levy Institute, former Central Bank of Norway. I have a question for Peter Prant um, regarding the outlook. Uh, I was just looking at the IMF uh, WEO for the euro area, and they are sort of showing a tapering off from, I think, two to one and a half. And, um, and my question is related to this sort of lowering of expectation that you mentioned that, that we also discussed regarding the U.S. economy yesterday, where, you know, uh, we, we saw that the potential output has been constantly revised downward, and so we're sort of uh, uh, saying that we are in a pretty good situation and accepting growth outlooks of around one and a half, two percent. And my question is really, how did we come to a situation where we suddenly see this as the new normal, and even as, as the situation where monetary policy should perhaps start to be uh, tightened. And um, I think you mentioned also the, the unemployment rate, but as we discussed yesterday for the US, uh, employment has not um, increased at the same pace as normal. Um, and so there is perhaps much more slack than you know, we would expect. So my question, I guess, is twofold. I mean, where are we? I mean, we, because we seem to have uh, someone being pretty rosy and upbeat on the outlook, like you, and then you have, you know, um, evidently more slack in the economy. And then the question is, what can we do? And um, monetary policy has been accommodating for long. Uh, IMF and others have advocated more fiscal stimulus. And even the European Commission has, in its own paper, advocated a, a very modest package of fiscal stimulus. Uh, but but there is, doesn't seem to be much support for it. So what can be done to get growth back up? Thank you. Thank you. Mayor, you want to answer a couple of these that you've been taking notes on, and then we'll take more questions after that? Yes, sir. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, first, on, on, on politics in general, uh, we, we have French elections, we'll see. Uh, uh, next week, a little bit what it gives, uh, because when you look at opinion polls, just contrary to Italy, by the way, but the support for the euro is, 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 is very strong, which led uh, some of the candidates to nuance uh, a little bit their position in very recent, uh, recent communication, you see that. We should not forget the other part uh, in some of the countries, not in all countries in, indeed, uh, but in France in particular, or, or in the UK, um, you have the migration problem. and so, so uh, I, I don't think the elections are about a, a referendum on the euro. Uh, there is a lot of discussions about regaining control, uh, migration, and I don't know something uh, on the economic policy in general. Uh, but in a global, the global environment, it's not so easy to do. I mean, that's uh, so. I say whatever the exchange rate. See, look at the debate in the U.S., for example. Uh, so regaining control in a global environment, what does that really mean? I mean, uh, so we still believe uh, that the exchange rate. Uh, is not the main issue uh, that we have. Of course, there may be in the adjustment process a number of problems, uh, but basically it's, I'm sorry to say that, but there are deep structural problems in a number of societies. And, uh, and I also go into the income distribution part, the impact of migration, for example, if you, there was a question of wages in Germany. Uh, basically, you can see the, the labor market in Germany as a, as a country where the manufacturing uh, sector has increased in a crisis in terms of value added, not in terms of employment but in terms of value added. So the share, the share of uh, manufacturing has increased in GDP in the crisis. Uh, the, the wage policy in, in Germany, you could, you could see it, uh, but it's, it's, it's not proven what I would say. But there is a sort of um, awareness about the consequences of uh, wage uh, claims by the unions on the manufacturing sector. It's a big sector in Germany. And in the consensual sort of model that you have, it is, it is somewhere it looks like as the employers uh, and, and uh, representatives of the employees or the workers have a sort of uh, exchange rate 
uh, the implication of wages compared to what the others. So, so there is a sort of awareness there. Uh, and so there is wage moderation uh, in, in the context that you can see. Relative. Yes, which, which doesn't facilitate the uh, internal adjustment process, which is, is an issue indeed. Now, the non-traded sector, the non-traded sector services, there you could say, well, in that sort of environment, uh, because there is a sort of uh, full employment sort of situation, uh, there you should see, you should see wages uh, increase in the non-traded sector compared to the others. But there uh, you, you get probably, and as I say, this is tentative what I say, you get the impact of migration, for example, and the very cheap, uh, flexible labor market that you have uh, in Germany, which explains also why unemployment uh, rate is so low. But these are uh, jobs which are not, uh, as, as <laughs> looks a little bit more US now, uh, that part of the labor market than it used to be in Germany. And that's a debate you have in the, uh, the uh, electoral campaign now in, in Germany about that. But it could be also that for the uh, protected sector, when we look at uh, inflation in services in, in Germany, and you uh, look at wages in Germany, there is some good correlation, of course, because wages are very important in the services sector in general. And you see that the wage evolution remains subdued uh, in the services sector as well. There, the public sector has some room, uh, and it's true that there is some elements of incomes policy in dealing with the problem. Uh, in a sort of cooperative way, and some people, including in the Bundesbank, uh, this time people working at the Bundesbank, like the, uh, the head of the economics department of the Bundesbank, has defended also that uh, wage policy would be part of the adjustment uh, process also. Uh, these are not easy things to deal with. But I wanted to say on the political situation, you have the migration dimension, we should not forget, including the impact on wages in services, and I think in Germany in particular. Uh, so that's one, one of the complex issue, and uh, mentioned the manufacturing. And, uh, but I think the, the main question is um, the uh, incapacity of uh, governments to convince their voters of uh, the necessity of structural reforms. And uh, I mean, look at Italy. Why do you have in Italy so many micro firms in Italy? And you remember that was linked very much to the labor market legislation, which mm -hmm. you have uh, triggers you know, at very low levels. Uh, then you need, you know, a rep unions representative, and the more you have people, you know that. And it's very easy to see how the the, the landscape, uh, the, the industrial landscape, evolved in function of these simple labor laws uh, about size of firms. And if you believe that the diffusion of technology is very much linked uh, to the size of firms, because the micro firms, the very micro firms, are not very good in the diffusion of technologies. Then you can also in, uh, see the link between labor market policies and the diffusion of ICT, uh, ITC uh, technologies, for example. There are papers on this. I'm not inventing that. I'm not, uh, there are very good papers on this. So you need in Italy, uh, as in other countries, but especially in Italy, a number of comprehensive <coughs> reforms which are not necessarily in the labor market, but are comprehensive. I mentioned insolvency procedures in Italy the efficiency of getting back collateral when a bank lends. I mean, to deal with the NPLs, that has been a key, a key problem that you have, et cetera, et cetera. I, I'm just saying that don't sell to the voters that when you get the exchange rate flexibility in an exit, which would be extremely difficult to manage in terms of stability of contract, but don't sell to the voters the idea that it's, a, it's an easy ride that would avoid to face the, the hard reality. On the banking system, I would say the same in Italy. It was not linked to financial innovation in the beginning. Uh, it was linked both to the economic recession. Then I think you have a point on the lack of management of demand uh, in uh, especially uh, 10, 2010 and 11, which uh, in Italy created, uh, of course, the, uh, the problems in the banking system. But, but you don't tell the other aspect. is a huge cost to income ratio already before in the banking system was not the most efficient banking system. And there's a big need of consolidation in Italy. When you say bail-in, bail-out story now, I, I say the BRRD provides for flexibility, uh, for financial stability reasons. So there, is, there are discussions about that. I don't want to go into that discussion. Uh, the only thing I can say that bail-in or bail-out, what I would like to see is a result of either or. You see a very structural adjustment in the banking sector. You see, I mean, really, that, that things are being addressed whatever the money comes from the taxpayer or from the private uh, creditors, uh, you want to see the results. And that has been quite slow compared 
to what we have seen uh, in Spain, for example, in the experience of Spain, for example. So these are also things we, I think this is well understood now by, uh, in Italy, of course, the problem, but that has been very slow in, in the adjustments. For me, the debate is, uh, is not only, it's also bail-in, bail-out, which is a real debate, but the main debate is whatever the money you put, you know, from creditors or from the taxpayers, you want to see results on the adjustment process. And that has been very slow, I mean, in, in some pockets of the banking system, because I wouldn't say at all that uh, there is a problem, a systemic problem of the banking sector in Italy, because as, as, as you know, uh, it's pockets in the, in, in the system. It's not the whole system. Um, now, other questions, there was, um, I'm a bit, uh, a bit on the economy. Oh, well, it's relative. Don't forget, uh, I'm a central bank. I look at the closing of the output gap with a, with a potential output which is slow. So from my point of view, closing the output gap would put pressure on the inflation at some point. So that's, that's our mandate, if you want. Now, if you take a broader, uh, I, I, nobody can be satisfied about the slowdown of productivity because all the promises on budget and off budget in terms of pensions have been based on much higher potential growth rates. Uh, and so, so the problem is the sustainability of public finances looking at 10, 20 years from now, uh, which, is, which is a problem of the slowdown of productivity. And if you, you combine that with the income distribution problem in a number of countries, uh, then of course you say that uh, the, the downside risk on, from the political side, from the society, uh, and so these rates are not. But there the central banker cannot do uh, much. The, the, what the central bank can do is support demand in recession to avoid, you know, hysteresis, and this is one sort of discussion. But the fundamental problems are still there, and uh, you can manage, of course, the, the recession to some extent, but if, uh, and how do you convince the population that there is a, a cooperative game to do uh, with reform and relying too much on demand and the exchange rate induced, you know, boom that you may get, you know, support, I think is, is fooling the people, frankly, I really think it's fooling the, po the people. The people who have to see, you know, the product market reforms, the labor market reforms, the uh, institutional settings, etc., etc. what I say. And, and this is, I think this is well understood by what you call the elites, uh, Jan. Uh, it's well understood. It's not so well understood by pro perhaps the population. I don't know. I don't know. I'm not a political scientist. So. Uh, okay, sorry. I know there are still more questions, but we have run out of time, and, and we have a wonderful speaker following this. So... Um, we're not the last act, so thank you very much for all your patience. And